Is council tax an unlawful tax? And if so, does that mean you have no obligation to pay council tax? Because I understand a lot of people are wondering this question because you see lots of videos and lots of people encourage you not to pay your council tax. And some of you genuinely question whether it's lawful or not. Now, before we get into that, if you are new to me, my name is Daniel Shensmith. I'm a barrister of England and Wales, and I enjoy helping you to understand law. So please do hit that like button and subscribe if you find this content useful. Now, in order to explain this, I'll give you the long explanation throughout this video. So make sure you do please watch till the end. It's quite fascinating. But if you want the short version, I'll give that to you now. Council tax is not an unlawful tax. And thus, there is an obligation upon you to pay your council tax if you are deemed to be a person liable to pay it, which I'll come back to a bit later in the video because there's a definitive list. And if you're unsure, you can always speak to your local authority. Now, to understand exactly where all of this comes from, we need to go back in time a little bit. Now, I'm not planning for this to be a full on history lesson. Um, there are many courses you can go on to do exactly that, but I will give you the very brief outlines. And if you find it interesting, then uh, please do check out those courses where you can look up uh, much more of the history. But here's a brief potted history of the law of England and Wales, uh, and of course, throughout the United Kingdom and so on. Now, beginning with that, there's a common misconception um, that there's a fundamental disconnect between common law and acts of parliament and general law, or what we would think of as primary legislation. A lot of people deriving the assumption that the council tax is unlawful from the notion that an act is not law, but obviously an act is law for reasons will be explained in this video. Now, as to that brief history, of the law of England and Wales. We have to go right back um, in, in two different sense. If we go back, first of all, to the first act of parliament, uh, we go back to Edward I, who formed the first parliament in 1275. This parliament was recalled about 46 times in 1275 that we have records of. And the first act of parliament was the Statute of Westminster. Now, the reasons for its formation, I'll come back to in just a moment. Now, this was not to be confused with the general concept of common law. A lot of people think that they are distinctly different and one applies and the other does not. But that is where the misunderstanding comes from. The common law principles essentially are just the decisions made by the king. Um, in There was one court in Westminster, the king would make these decisions. And this dates back to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So these initial decisions made by the king were without necessarily anyone else's knowledge or consent, but they would apply to everyone regardless. And these initial decisions were binding and they became the body that we retained as common law. Now, as I said, the first act of parliament in 1275 um, was, well, at least for one reason, um, along with the taxes that were brought about with it, were to pay for the battles that were going on at the time. They obviously needed to be paid for. So the taxes that came about with the first act of parliament and the first parliament in 1275 was to do exactly that, was to pay for these battles. But it was not until the uh, 16th and 17th centuries where parliament um, saw its supremacy established. And again, uh, a long history lesson short, there was a long dispute between parliamentarians and um, royalists. Um, but ultimately, it established that Parliament had the authority to make binding laws on all British subjects and citizens, regardless of their knowledge or consent. Now, the consent to be governed is, again, something slightly different. That is the collective consent by way of voting locally for a representative to stand in Parliament as your member of Parliament for that constituency. More about that in other videos, perhaps. And furthermore, the uh, principle of ignorance being no excuse is also a long-standing principle way back to the origins of common law um, in England and Wales. And again, meaning that every subject and citizen is bound by all of these decisions, by all of these laws, regardless of their knowledge, awareness or consent. Now, 
that is the briefest potted history of the origins of law and now the supremacy of parliament to make new law by way of acts of parliament once they received royal assent. That was the sort of process that was established and agreed upon. That process established that parliament had the ultimate supreme power to make new law. The only thing a parliament cannot do is to bind a future parliament. A future parliament can make or repeal any law. Now fast forward to the modern day, 1992 in fact, we have an act of parliament, a piece of legislation, a law, a primary piece of law called the Local Government Finance Act, 1992. Made by the Westminster Parliament, binding on the entirety of the UK and every subject and every citizen, whether or not they have any awareness of it. Now, under section six, this brings us to the explanation of council tax, why it is a lawful tax, lawful meaning it is within the law, it is permissible by law, and it applies to every subject and citizen. Now, the persons liable to pay council tax are set out in section six. And there's a hierarchy here, which covers pretty much every situation you could imagine. And if there's one that you can't quite fathom, it will fit into one of these somehow and a court will decide as much. But these cover each of the scenarios, whether somebody outright owns the property as the freeholder, um, whether they are just a resident, whether they are a resident with a contractual license, whether they have a leasehold interest in the property, in the whole or any part of the dwelling. Uh, and bearing in mind, these apply to uh, dwellings. And a dwelling is also set out in the Local Government Finance Act. And in short, it is any property which is a domestic property, with some exceptions. Maybe we'll cover those exceptions in another video. But provided that it is a dwelling, council tax will apply to it under various bans. That just means different amounts depending on where they are. And then the liability to pay the council tax falls on the people that we've just talked about there. Now, many people ask about caravans and boats. Those are also covered within the Act. And the Act, of course, sets out the basic amounts, the discounts, and all of these sort of things. So um, without going deep into council tax itself, it is set out, the obligation is set out by this piece of law, this primary Act of Parliament, which is binding on every citizen and subject of the United Kingdom, um, regardless of their knowledge, regardless of their consent. Now, there's a lot of technicalities about informing or not having to inform the local authority that you live there. For example, if you move, um, previous case law has said that you don't necessarily need to inform the council that you've moved in. But if they ask you uh, who's living there, you cannot be dishonest and you need to tell them. And so one of the cases that went to court uh, was over fraud. Um, the argument being that there was a dishonest statement made to the local authority as to whether or not someone uh, was living there or not. Now, again, as I say, there's, there's a technicality as to whether you need to inform them, but when they write to you, that doesn't mean you can just ignore them. You, you need to tell them who is there, and they will bill the council tax to whoever is liable to pay that council tax according to the hierarchy set out in Section 6. And all of this, going way back, all of this stems from the origins of law, from the first act of parliament, um, from the first parliament in 1275, um, when it was established. And of course, common law has also prevailed because decisions made by judges interpreting the acts of parliament as primary law, as they apply to different situations, there may be a situation that the act of parliament hasn't quite codified. And so the judge's job is to interpret Parliament's intent. And there are two ways of doing this. Judges can take a literal reading of uh, the Act of Parliament and say, well, it doesn't say this, therefore we are not applying it that way. Or they can take the interpretative uh, approach and say, well, Parliament intended to restrict, curtail, control or, or govern uh, any area of society. And so that is how we will apply it. And that becomes common law. When there are enough of these cases, common law being um, 
consumer law being a classic example where there's a lot of different decisions, there's lots of bits of legislation, then we had European law bolted into it, and all of these things came together, culminated in a bit of a mess for consumers to understand. So in 2015, we had the Consumer Rights Act to codify, insofar as possible, all of the consumer law and the rights that go along with consumer law into one piece of legislation. Still didn't quite make it because we retained the information in consumer contracts regulations from 2013. So they still sort of find their way in. So they don't just fall by the wayside. They are still law and we still have to comply with those. And there are certain other bits of legislation that also apply to consumer law, such as the Consumer Credit Act. Section 75 being a big one where you pay for something by way of a credit agreement. The credit provider has a joint liability with the trader under legislation, so they all work together. And then, of course, the common law works in tandem because if there's a decision in court applying all of this law that you can then use as a precedent and say, well, in that case, this happened. My case is the same, so respectfully, the court should apply the same decision in my case. And one example is whether this sounds reasonable or not is up for debate, but this is how it is, so don't shoot the messenger. But the more you pay for something, the higher quality you should expect from it. So if you buy a car for £2,000 as against a car for £120,000, there is a significant difference in the price between the two. One should be able to expect courts have decided more from the £120,000 car than the £2,000 car. Although the basic principles and the basic rights and the basic implied terms into the contract, reasonable, you know, satisfactory quality, reasonably fit for purpose, and so on, are all implied into the same contract, regardless of the price. But the degree to which you can scrutinize will go up the more you've paid for it. That's common law interacting with acts of parliament. That's how it works. That's how the law works. Very, very brief overview. Some historians, and particularly legal historians, are free, and I'm, I welcome corrections and modifications of my interpretation and my memory recall because I'm not, these videos are unscripted, I'm, I don't have the encyclopedias in front of me, so feel free to leave those comments respectfully in the comments section below, and I welcome that. But for anyone that's genuinely wondering how council tax applies, why it is a lawful tax, why there is an obligation to pay it, and certain videos discourage you from doing so. Um, but this is a very brief overview. I hope you found it interesting. Please do like the video and subscribe. And as always, thank you so much for watching.